You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. You, you feel this this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Packernet After Dark. How you doing? What's been going on with you? Hope things are well. Got a bunch of calls. We got to run through uh, lots and lots and lots of them. I want to get caught up on, by the end of this, every call that isn't a Tom call. Uh, that I can do. Tom, I can't promise I can get through all of yours. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 24 Tom calls. Um, I like to get caught up on all the calls prior to the game. I can't promise I can get through. I mean, I know we've got an extra day with Sunday, but, um, that's the goal is to get caught up on, we'll do Tom calls mixed with everybody else's and try to get everything else done. Does that kind of make sense? I might have said that's stupid, but I think you get the point. But with that said, we are going to start from the beginning. We don't have any new callers. New callers, by the way, if you'd like to uh, go right to the front of the line, you can do so. Just call 608-501-0718 or uh, anybody that'd like to participate, please do so. Give us your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions. Let's get this thing started. All right. So I was listening to uh, Poisonous Animals the discussion there over in New Zealand. Yeah. And I guess across the world and figuring out where to go. Sure. Uh, just want to clarify, there is a difference between poisonous and venomous. Okay. One, like you, you can die. Okay. You, by one of them, you can also still die. So there might be a little discrepancy there that needs to be worked on. But that's just what I'm trying to clarify. So help. All right, bye. Wait. <laughs> so, difference between poisonous and venomous. One is that you can die. Uh, you can all, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't understand that. What's the difference? One of them is that you can die. What's the other one? You can't die or you might die or, and which one's which? I got to Google it because I feel like you're making this up. Poison is a toxin that gets into the body by inhaling, swallowing, or absorbing through the skin. Venomous is when the toxin is injected into you. Okay. So it sounds to me like we're just using poisonous incorrectly when we say that a snake is poisonous it's not poisonous it's venomous so there is a distinction i don't know what that distinction has to do with what we were talking about there are um venomous animals in uh new zealand or yeah new zealand right are any of them poisonous trying to think of any of them like a jellyfish is still a sting right so the, the poison is still injected into you so i think they're all technically venomous but not poisonous, because poison, it would be inhaling, swallowing, or absorbing. But like those frogs, those are, those are poisonous frogs, because you just you touch them, and then the poison is on them, and then it absorbs into your skin. Again, not sure how that helps, but it is interesting information, and I'm glad you told me that, because I didn't know that, or at least never thought of that. I would have thought that a snake, a venomous snake, injects... I mean, I know they inject venom into you, but... I would have thought that venom was like a poison. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But now I know. Hey, this is Corey from Ohio again. Hey. Do you think if Christian Watson averages, say, 50 yards a game and a touchdown for the rest of the season, he's got a chance to win Rookie of the Year? Let me know what you think. 50 yards and a touchdown for the rest of the season. Um... I guess I don't know because Christian Watson's such an unusual case. I, I I generally think you're looking at cumulative numbers. Everybody wants the big numbers. 
And um, let's just look at, for example, some of the other guys that are in the running. Who's that running back? I think makes a lot of sense. Well, I guess there's two. Damian Pierce has 939 yards already, so he's going to crack 1,000 yards, assuming he's not hurt. Uh, But Kenneth Walker has nine touchdowns. So if he can get to 1,000 yards and over 10 touchdowns, it's going to be hard to compete with that. Um, Looking at wide receivers, Chris Olave has uh, 887, Garrett Wilson 868. If those guys can crack 1,000 yards, the, the problem with them is they don't have any touchdowns to back it up. Um, again, the guy with the most touchdowns is Christian Watson. Uh, the only one that's even really close is Jahan Dotson, and Watson has more yards than Dotson does. So I guess it just depends. I mean, it, it's again, it's such an unusual thing where it's hard to imagine. What did you say? Let's, let's say uh, you said 50 yards a game, and we got four left, so 200 yards. He would only have 600 yards, but he'd have 11 touchdowns. I think the the bigger question would be, what if he has 600 yards and nine touchdowns, if he only gets two more? Because obviously there's something aesthetically pleasing to that double-digit touchdown mark. And could you even consider giving the award based on cumulative stats to a guy with nine touchdowns and 600 yards? Granted, he has more touchdowns than just about any other rookie, aside from maybe two running backs, or one, I don't even know. But the yardage would be tough you know when you got probably a couple guys with over a thousand yards but obviously the the thing that everybody would be missing in that is that it's not about cumulative it's what he's done in such a small period of time when you look at the yards and touchdowns on a per game basis there's no question he is the biggest superstar among all the rookies and it's not even close but he missed a bunch of time now i'm generally a per game guy so i would look at it from that standpoint however there is something to be said about sustained success and putting up a lot of yards and being successful I mean, there's got to be some kind of a line. I mean, if you miss two games and just miss 10 yards and 1,000 or 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns, whatever. If what if you missed half a season? What if you only played four games? You know, if you did, if you like, if, if Watson was hurt for the rest of the year, could you give it to him? Well, based on a per game basis, I mean, it's 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 a historic pace, but it's only four games. So I don't. I guess I don't know where you draw the line. He's certainly in com- a conversation though, because. There's not that many other guys um, as far as Offensive Rookie of the Year. Again, you got Olave and Garrett Wilson, who are likely to crack 1,000 yards. You've got Watson with the touchdown. I think those are the only three wide receivers. Then you've got, again, Damian Pierce, who's going to have a bunch of yards, and Kenneth Walker with a bunch of touchdowns, and potentially 1,000 yards. Again, if he cracks 1,000 yards, it's going to be tough because he's going to have over 1,000 yards and more than probably more than 10 touchdowns. He has about 709 touchdowns right now. Although that does include, he plays for Seattle, that does include this last game. Um, so he's only got three left. So that actually could be a little bit tough. You need about a little over 100 yards a game. And he hasn't even hit 100 yards since week nine. So he's probably not going to get to 1,000. Um, touchdowns are a possibility, although he has gone touchdown lists in his last two games. So we will see. And obviously the quarterbacks, who usually are shoe-ins for this um, nobody should be getting this. Kenny Pickett is the only one that with even over 1,000 yards. 1,000. He's the only one. He has 1,797 yards, but he has four touchdowns and eight interceptions. No chance on planet Earth that he should be getting this. After that would be offensive line is the only other position, and nobody's going to touch offensive line. I mean, nobody's going to give a, an offensive rookie of the year award to an offensive lineman. I'm not even going to bother looking at it. So in reality... You've got Damian Pierce, Kenneth Walker, Chris Olave, Christian Watson, and Garrett Wilson. Those are the five, like today. Watson is never going to catch these guys in yards. The best bet that he has is he has to, a minimum, he has to get over 500 receiving yards, which he should be able to do pending any injury, and he needs to crack the uh, the 10 touchdown mark. And and the the added rushing touchdowns and rushing yards and everything is only going to add to it. But I, I think... The, the biggest thing, because again, he can't catch these guys in certain areas. He has to be well above and beyond in touch. In fact, if he could lead all of them in touchdowns, which I think he does by, uh, let me check, because I don't know if these other running backs have receiving touchdowns too. Damian Pierce has one receiving touchdown. That's it. So yeah, Kenneth Walker has nine touchdowns. Christian, I think Watson has nine, right? Total. So he's actually tied among all rookies with touchdowns. 
So, I mean, the bottom line is he's in the conversation. It's just a matter of what they want to bring. If, it, if it's just raw stats that they want, you probably want to go with Kenneth Walker. Although it does work to his advantage that he's a wide receiver. If we're just going for flashy, there's nothing more flashy than a, than a deep threat wide receiver who got a ridiculous amount of touchdowns in almost no time whatsoever. The fact that he's even in the conversation, having only been really a part of the offense for four weeks, is staggering. But he does have to he does have to continue it. If the if the touchdown spigot turns off and he has like one or two in the remaining four games, probably not going to be the guy. Would be my guess. Hey, Ryan, I got a question. Okay. <clears throat> um, how much does it cost for Santa to park his reindeer? Nothing, because it's on the house. You're welcome. Oh, boy. Tom, you want to try again? Let's try that again. So it is December 13th. And we this is the first December of Packing It After Dark. Yes. So I feel in, encouraged by the season to annoy people. So for the next 12 days, I'm going to be calling in specifically to do the 12 days of Christmas, but we're doing the 12 days of uh, Pac-mas, or pac No, I... Who knows? No. I just wanted to inform you okay. that that will be happening. Um, give me a little bit of time to uh, come up with the first one, and uh, I'll be back. Be, be, be prepared and beware. All right, that's over. All right, bye. It's all for two, Tom. Let's uh, let's kick it over to Stephen Alaska. Hey, Ryan, Steve up in Alaska. What's going on? Just want to bring up a point. We've been talking about uh, defensive leaders, and I know actually we've been talking about a lot of nothing lately because True. nothing's been going on. But when we talk about team, we've been talking about defensive leaders. You've mentioned a couple of people, really primarily like Ray Lewis. You know, we got to get a Ray Lewis guy on the team. I wish I could think of a better example. I just, I, I can't. I just blank. There's a lot of guys that would fit in that category. He's just the one that comes to mind. You like lead that defense? I, I, I think you're wrong. We don't need a Ray Lewis guy. All right. We need a Charles Woodson guy. We need a Reggie White guy. We've had a couple of those guys. They're not a Ray Lewis guy. They're totally different. They are. We need those two kinds of guys. I, I think that's the type of player we need to have. We can talk about it. We can look at what they do statistically and what they are. Ray Lewis was a thug. He was an he was an aggressor. He was an attacker. He was an arrogant. <laughs> Sorry about that. I I had to bleep myself. What we need is a guy that talks team, a guy that talks about passion, a guy that leads us and wants everybody to be better, not only on the field, but as people. And those make great leaders. Don't ask me why I just came out of nowhere watching some other games, but it popped in my head and I said, do it. Um, we'll talk to you all later. Have a good night. Bye. Yeah, my hesitation with saying Woodson is that it's a very specific thing because Woodson wasn't a big talker. Ray Lewis was, and I understand he he has a lot of character flaws, which is why if I could think of somebody else, I would. Um, but my my concern with a I mean not not Woodson, but a guy like Woodson, if that was our our prototype that we're looking for is I would want somebody that can rally the troops. Woodson is a lead by example guy, my understanding. Um, but because it's Charles freaking Woodson, you know, people will follow and people will listen when he speaks and people will, you know, they, 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 he absolutely can rally people. I don't, who in the NFL right now even is a Charles Woodson? Probably is somebody, but I don't know who they are. There's a guy that is at his peak, that is um, a veteran, that is unbelievably respected, 
that if he came into the Green Bay Packers locker room would be able to cultivate a culture of, I don't know, got guys that just are willing to fight and die for this thing, you know? A f- really strong belief. I'm, I'm, I'm not in disagreement with you at all. My, my only concern is I think it's easier to find good football players that are great locker room guys that people can rally around than it is to find a Charles Woodson, a guy that doesn't even need to speak to transform a locker room. I mean, you know, Aaron Donald is, is an elite football player, but he's kind of a garbage human in my opinion. I don't think he wouldn't come here. He's on the verge of retirement, but, but I'm, I'm just saying, who, who would that guy even be? Who's the Charles Woodson in the NFL right now? And if we are just talking about coaches as opposed to like what Woodson did as a person in the locker room, which is a different thing than I think what I was talking about, because there is something to, to being like a guy in the locker room and leading by example and, and, a, and a coach, which is part of the reason why the whole Ray Lewis thing came up, because you know coaches are a little bit more distant and outside of the locker room. And so penetrating into the locker room to be able to cultivate, um, I don't know, maybe requires a little bit more. <laughs> um, flamboyancy might not be the right word, but you get what I'm saying. So, yeah, I, and, and I don't really know anything about Reggie's character in the locker room. I really don't. I don't know what kind of a guy he I mean, I know he was a, a, a good guy, but I don't know if he was a, a rah-rah guy or if he was a quiet guy or what. But yeah, I was mostly just talking about bringing in a person to be like an assistant coach that just has a mentality and an attitude, specifically a guy that has played, you know, I mean, interestingly enough, look at D'Amico Ryans over in San Francisco right now. And I'm not saying that has to do with necessarily their success, but I will say that doesn't look great for the uh, Robert Sala, right? Oh, he's this elite guy, whatever. And then D'Amico Ryans comes in and the defense gets even better. It's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> okay. Maybe we just have great players. I don't know. But I I do think that there's something to playing for a former player, especially a player that's played at a high level, right? Jim Leonard was a former player, but, you know, he wasn't, uh, well, he wasn't Charles Woodson or Ray Lewis. And and honestly, look, I I don't know what this locker room needs. This this was just my thinking out loud, that if we had a guy that can instill, like, this is is what you need to do. This is what it takes. You know, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to step up to be sort of a counterbalance to the sort of negative attitudes and negative, you know, comments and whatever else is going on in that locker room and saying, you know what, if you want to do that, you go do that. But if you want to come over here and be a, a, a champion in this league, then you come stand by me. But I don't know what they need. I really don't. I don't know what they want. I don't know what they need. I, I have, I don't know, but they need something else. So I'm an episode behind on Pat, on uh, packing it after dark. And I got to say, Anti-Tom messages are okay with me. I'm fine with it. Because, quite frankly, I skip through my questions, too, mostly because I know what I asked. There you go. And then I just listen to the answers. Uh, but, yeah, no, no. Ending ending on an anti-Thomas message, that, that's 100% fine. Um, and a follow-up from an earlier call. <coughs> That one's for you. You know who you are. You guys you guys know you're just encouraging it, right? Every time you call in with an anti Tom call, he's got fifteen queued up. I'm I'm just just so we're all on the same page here. On the first day of Pac Miss Goody gave to me I told you. one potential superstar rookie. All right, we'll be back with another edition tomorrow. <clears throat> Bye. I didn't know that's what you meant you were going to do, Tom, and I am, I am horrified. All right. Uh, there's so much scrolling I have to do to get up to. All right. We're back to Steve. Well, right out there, Ryan. Steve, hit the, uh, hit the wrong button there. Did I not finish your last? I don't think I did. That's all right. We'll go with this. Sorry. Do it again. Well, right out there, Ryan. Steve, it's all good. Hit, the, uh, hit the wrong button there. Yeah. Um, I just want you to do a statistical number for us. I right. like you to do a comparative analysis. Oh, that sounds hard. Uh, I, I like you to look at Devontae Adams, Sterling Sharp. Um, hold on a second here. I lost the name in my head here. Um, Greg Jennings, not really, but um, oh, James Lofton. That's the guy. James yeah. Lofton. 
I, I like you to take a comparative analysis for the length of time that each of those players was with us and what their numbers were statistically and which one of those four, I'll say those four, is the better wide receiver statistically for the Packers during the time they played with us. That's the thing. That's the thing I think would be very interesting to see. I, I personally think Sterling Sharp is going to be the guy that like blows everybody out the water, but that that's my thing. I'm, I'm older than you by like ten years, so I saw Sterling play. Dude, this is awesome. Um. Anyways, my fact. For the record, I saw Sterling play also. Just maybe not. Uh, don't recall his early years. All right, let's pull it up. And we'll just look at side by side, but Sterling Sharp. Um, so he, in his rookie year, didn't he didn't quite get to eight hundred yards. After that, fourteen hundred and twelve touchdowns, eleven hundred six touchdowns, nine hundred yards and four touchdowns, fourteen hundred yards, thirteen touchdowns, twelve hundred yards, eleven touchdowns, eleven hundred yards, eighteen touchdowns. Um. I'm going to go ahead and rule out Greg Jennings from this little competition we're doing. Um, no disrespect to Greg, but he basically just had about a three-year stretch. Eh, you can call it a four-year stretch. Um, 920 yards and 12 touchdowns. And then he had three years of over 1,000, three years of over 1,100, actually. 1,292 and nine touchdowns, 1,104 and 1,212 touchdowns. Um, so, I, you know, again, I would prefer probably go with Sterling on that. He had one, two, three, four, five years over a thousand, um, six years of nearly a thousand, and then had one, two, three, four years of over ten touchdowns, including his eighteen touchdown um, year. I will say it's a little closer than I expected. Obviously, Sterling didn't have the opportunity to play as long as he should have been able to, but even still, um, I think that was a pretty solid four-year stretch for Jennings there. But still, Sterling wins that round. Um, James Lofton, let's see. So as far as the Green Bay Packers go, cause he played a long time after he left two years with the Raiders and then, uh, four and a half years with the Buffalo Bills, a year and a half with Philly. And then a year with the Rams. He played from 1978 all the way to 1993. So that's pretty wild. But with the Green Bay Packers, you've got uh, so 800, 900, and then he got into 1,000, uh, 1,200, 1,200, 700, 13, 13, 11, and then his last year was back down to eight. So he had his one, two, three, four, five, six year stretch. He unfortunately got injured in the middle, which is why he only had the 700 yards, and that was in nine games. So. You figure if you add seven more games to that, he cracks another 1,200, which is remarkable because he had 1,200, nearly 1,300, was on pace for another whatever, and then 1,300, and then 1,300, and then 1,100. I mean, that's insane. The only negative, because I would say, well, how did Sharp do with injuries? He wasn't injured one single game in that entire stretch. In terms of yardage, well... Sharp did have 1461 and 1423. It's 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 this is a heck of a stretch from Lofton. It's nearly as impressive just looking at that stretch from a yardage standpoint, but the touchdowns aren't there. And that same stretch 484874. And his first two years were 800 and 900, which again are fine, but six and four touchdowns. And then his last year with Green Bay, 840 yards. He missed one game. Um but also four touchdowns. So he didn't have the touchdown production that Sterling Sharp did. I will say a a nod should go out to Donald Montgomery Hudson, Mr. Don Hudson. Um, Again, from a statistical standpoint, he can't really touch what some of these other guys have done. But considering he played in the 30s and 40s, and he had um, in in 1942, he had 1,200 yards and 17 touchdowns. In 1940, freaking two, when it was like, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and that's basically all we do. He had three seasons in a row with double digit touchdowns 10, 17, and then 11. His final two years, he had nine and nine. 
he led the league in receiving yards uh, four years in a row. He did it six out of seven years in a row. In fact, there were only one, two, three, four years where he didn't lead the league in receiving yards, and he played from 1935 to 1945. In 1936, he led the league in receiving yards with 536. (laughs) In uh, 35, he led the league in touchdowns with six. So again, the fact that he had 1,200 yards and 73 touchdowns, or 73 touchdowns, 17 touchdowns, is absolutely ridiculous. I think as far as era adjusted, I don't know if anybody can touch what he did. But anyways, let's look at Devontae Adams and see where he stacks up next to Sterling Schaap. So for Devontae, you're primarily looking at, I guess it would be 2018 through 2022. So it's about a five-year stretch. For Sterling, it was a one, two, three, four, five, six-year stretch. Um, You could include Devontae's 2016-2017 2016-2017 year, you got 997 and 885 yards. But 2018, 1,300 yards, 13 touchdowns. Uh, the next year, he played 12 games, got 997 yards and five touchdowns. Then 1,318, 1,511, and 1,212. Here, let's do this. Let's have some of these years cancel each other out just so we can kind of whittle it down. And we'll leave out his 2022 season because that's with the Raiders. Um, So in 1989, Sterling had 1,423 yards and 12 touchdowns. In 2018, Devontae had 1,386 and 13 touchdowns. That's almost identical. We'll cancel those two out. 2021, Devontae had 1,500 yards, 11 touchdowns. Uh, Sterling in 92 had uh, 1,461 and 13 touchdowns. So we'll call that even. Two more touchdowns for Sterling, but uh, about 100 more yards for Devontae. In uh, 1994, Sterling had 1,100 yards and 18 touchdowns. Devontae had 1,300 yards and 18 touchdowns. That's 200 more yards. You can't exactly cancel it out. So I'm just going to make a note that Devontae has a 200-yard advantage here. In uh, 2019, Devontae, 997 and five touchdowns. Sterling, 961 and four touchdowns. That uh, cancels out, but we'll give Devontae a one touchdown advantage. 2016, Devontae, 1,000 yards and 12 touchdowns. 1993, 1,200 yards and 11 touchdowns for Sterling. That cancels out the 200-yard advantage, but Devontae goes up to two touchdowns. Then in uh, 2017, Devontae had 885 yards and 10 touchdowns. In 1990, Sterling... 1,100 yards and six touchdowns. Devontae has four more um, touchdowns, but 300 less yards. You could borderline just cancel that out. That would leave Sterling's one year of 800 yards and a touchdown, and Devontae has his first two years where he had about 800 yards and four touchdowns. So that would give that, that would mean that they basically perfectly cancel out. Devontae has a couple touchdown advantage on him. Now you can... Change that up however you want, but this is about a perfectly even matchup between Sterling and Devontae. And again, a little bit unfair because Sterling didn't get the opportunity. If he could have played one more year, he could have had the advantage. But I would say, based on where they're at right now, they're almost perfectly even. If I had to give a an advantage to somebody, and yes, Devontae did play more years, but it was only uh, was it one or two more years? Did I count the Raiders? I didn't. So it's a one more year advantage. But remember, the first Devontae's first two years are about equivalent to Sterling's first year. So those two almost cancel each other out for those three years. It's very similar. But again, just based on this little thing I did, I would give Devontae a slight advantage over Sterling Sharp. Yes, his eight years compared to Sterling's seven, Devontae has a slight advantage. If you compare seven to seven, let's just call it perfectly even and leave it at that. So I decided to do a little dive uh, into wide receivers this year. All right. And I have a list, top five. And I'm curious to hear what your top five is. Now, with that being said, this is so far. This can change by the end of the year. However, and this this is a little wonky list, I will admit. Uh, but hear me out. At number one, it is not one person. It is 1A, 1B. Okay. Stephon Diggs, I hate to say it, and Devontae Adams. I hate to say it, but for a different reason. Still love him. Uh, 
and then followed that up, there's no number three. There's two number threes. Three A, Justin Jefferson, and three B, Tyree Kill. Okay. And then you drop down to five. And that would be Amon Ross St. Brown. Now, if I take the ties into consideration, let's say there's... Well, you just listed PFF's top five wide receivers, so I think you're doing all right. One, A, one B, two A, two B, three is Amon Ross, which people can dispute. I'm, there's no way list is going to be perfect, and it's not going to be everyone's agreement, but no, I wouldn't mind other people to call in and give me their top five. But anyway, number four after Amon Ra is A.J. Brown. And then number five, a nice little uh, secret getting quite in there, C.D. Lamb. Right. Fun little thing. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and for other people to call in and send in theirs. All right. Bye. Just trying to figure out your uh, justification for that. And I was looking at it, and you said Devontae and Stephon Diggs, and they have the top two touchdowns among wide receivers. However, A.J. Brown is next. Now, you did add A.J. Brown later, so I'm thinking you were pretty heavy on touchdowns. Um, uh, However, the next highest was Jamar Chase, who was not on your list at all. Um. And then, in far as as far as yardage, you got Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, AJ Brown. So, if you look at yards first, and then weight it heavier toward touchdowns, of those five, you would have Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, AJ Brown, with Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill. Um, unless you have PFF, then you just went down PFF's list, and they have it: Tyreek number one, Devontae number two, Amon Ra number three, Justin Jefferson four, Stephon Diggs five. Um, AJ Brown is eight. CD lamb is 11. Um, lamb also makes sense just because he has six touchdowns compared to, uh, Jamar, but he's higher in yards, which I think we said you probably started with yards first. Although if you did Jalen Waddle would have been much higher. He has a thousand yards and six touchdowns. Anyways, um, the guys in between that you missed would be Cooper cup, Kaderil Hodge, believe it or not. Um, and then Jamar Chase and 2-2 Atwell. 2-2 freaking Atwell in uh, L.A. I don't know what he's doing. He hasn't played all that much, I guess. Uh, 237 yards and a touchdown. But playing well. Deshaun Jackson. Deshaun Jackson. He's only played four games. He might be out injured. I don't know. But he's also graded quite highly. Who would be mine? I don't know. I mean, if if you had asked me prior to looking at this list, which it's already too late... Um, I probably would have had Diggs, Jefferson, and Devontae as the top three. I don't know if I could have told you much beyond that. I suppose if you had me look at the statistics, I would have seen Tyreek Hill cracking about 1,500 yards. Um, He's got 1,460. Justin Jefferson has exactly 1,500, but I already listed him. So Tyreek would probably be on the list. Um, And then, yeah, I mean, A.J. Brown has 10 touchdowns. And I've, I've been saying for a while he's underrated. So... Pretty likely he'd be on the list as well. But, I mean, Justin Jefferson's a freak. So if I was forced to pick the best receiver in the NFL right now, I'd be hard-pressed to not pick Justin Jefferson, as much as it makes me sick. Anyways, why don't we take a quick break right here. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you'd like to support this podcast directly. Also, please consider giving to Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. You can do so at FertileGroundRanch.org. Take a break. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. 
Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, Ryan. Uh, I just wanted to call and say, if uh, folks would like to support my podcast, they can do so at patreon.com slash JJ Leahy. And if you don't like Patreon, I also have both of those are JJ Leahy as well. So I want to get that important announcement out there. And I promise you, I didn't do that. His phone just sucks. I think that, you know, good thing to do for the community. Got a couple grand laying around or even a little bit less. You know, you're doing the Lord's work by supporting my podcast. So, all right, that's all. Thanks. Well, we need a football game. That's what we need. We need a football game. We have Thomas Austin singing and JJ is begging for money. And that was the last non-Tom call. So, um... Buckle up, because here, here we go. I have to think about something you said on the podcast a couple days ago. Okay. About how you can't buy a Super Bowl. The Rams did. The, the Ra- Bucks did. First of all, when I've ever said you can't buy a Super Bowl, w- with very few exceptions, and if so, on accident, I've always referenced the Bucks. The Rams bought the worst playoff team in the entire group of playoffs. And they didn't buy that whole team. They, they paid for Odell Beckham. They drafted Aaron Donald, and he is 95% of that defense. Yes, Jalen Ramsey, they went and acquired like seven years ago. But I, I think what's lost on this is that the Bucks are the only team that went out and bought a really, really good, hard-to-beat football team. And that's being used and applied to a concept that if you want a good football team, you can just go buy one. We have decades and decades of examples of teams, including the Packers, spending a lot of money and not ending up the best. We, we did this in 2019. We spent a bunch of money and got a bunch of players. And yeah, we, we got better, not because of just those guys, by the way. Aaron Rodgers going from being washed up to returning to MVP form certainly did not hurt. But yeah, Zadarius was a, a big help, and Preston was a help, and a lot of that, it all contributed. But we didn't win a Super Bowl. And so yeah, if you look over 20, 30, 40 years of history, and we now have one example of a team building a good team. Do you remember that dream team that the Eagles put together some, what, 10, 15, 20 years ago, whatever? It was the dream team, and, and the, their GM was like a cap genius for being able to pull it off and the way in which he did it to get these guys, and it was unbelievable. They were so bad. So in hindsight, if we're just going to find a team that won the Super Bowl and say, did they go out in free agency and acquire players, and then say, therefore, you can buy a Super Bowl, that's incorrect, because that doesn't account for the 31 other teams that spent a crap ton of money in free agency and didn't win a Super Bowl, right? So you can't buy a Super Bowl. If I go down to the store and grab a six-pack of soda pop and give the cashier money, I'm going to get it. If I go to McDonald's and hand them money for 20 nugs, I'm going to get 20 nugs. What happens if you pay for a bunch of players in the the offseason? Did you buy a Super Bowl? No, you bought players. You cannot buy a Super Bowl. It is possible 
to win a Super Bowl having acquired a bunch of players. It's also it's also possible to win a Super Bowl having not acquired a bunch of players. And it's almost guaranteed that you will not win a Super Bowl if you acquire a bunch of players. I think I've done this before, but just as an example. Do you know which team brought in the most players this year? The Atlanta Falcons. How are they doing? After that was the Raiders. After that was the Texans. After that, the Giants, then the Dolphins, then the Bears, then the Bills. Oh, 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 they bought a Super Bowl. Well, no, first of all, they didn't win a Super Bowl. Second of all, they were already good last year. After that, Carolina, then the Saints, then the 49ers, then Cleveland, then Minnesota, then Tampa, then Arizona, then Denver, then Kansas City. The Jaguars spent the most money of any team. Then it's the Jets. The Jets are improved, there's no doubt about it. Are they improved because of their new players, number one? And number two, are they going to win a Super Bowl? So I repeat, for the 19th time, you cannot buy a Super Bowl. There have been teams that have spent a bunch of money that did win a Super Bowl. But that's only looking backward, can you say that? And you can do that for every team. I, I can go back every single year and find the... the here, let's, let's do that. Let's go back to 2021. Nope, literally my internet stopped working, so that's cool. The point is, I can go back and find every single Super Bowl team and determine whether or not they spent money. And the conclusion will be, yes, they did. Because every team spends money every single year in free agency. I don't even know if I can play the rest of your call now. I'm going to try, see how this goes. Their Super Bowls are... Nope. All right. Well, I guess I'm taking a break. Break over. All right. Heavily involved on buying it. They made super teams to be able to win. The Rams, they had to fight. So you do have a, the point there in the fact that just because you bought the team doesn't mean that the team is going to be automatically the greatest thing. And the Bucks, sort of the same thing, but they were a hardcore defensive juggernaut. And Brady was able to buy anything and everything he wanted for his little team. And that's another thing that I knock on Tom Brady is that he can't ever win on his own. He has to either have great coaching and and a great defense. But, you know, that's neither here nor there because he did fit the scheme well. He did play above and beyond what a lot of others tried to. There's a whole entire chain of thought going on that I can uh, go off of this, but I'll just cut it at that. Where you, you can buy... You can buy buy what? a Super Bowl. No, you can't. <laughs> is it guaranteed? No, but your okay, chances the, significantly increase. Then you can't buy a Super Bowl. You can't buy a Super Bowl. That's the point. You cannot buy a Super Bowl. I'm not going to argue with you that getting free agents is going to help your odds. It's why every team does it. But let me just ask you plain and simple. Because it's easy to read back into, into the past and to Monday morning quarterback it and say, find the team that won. In fact, now that the internet's working, let's, let's go ahead and do that. 2021, the Rams won the Super Bowl, right? Did they invest in um, free agency? Yes, they did. Do you want to know something that maybe not a lot of people know? They spent, you know where they ranked in their spending in free agency in 2021? Dead last. They spent $1.25 million on Odell Beckham. They spent $1 million on Corey Bajorquez. They spent $780,000 on Kareem Orr. And they spent $660,000 on Kyle Markway. Well, that's not fair. What about trades? That's a good point. You got Matt Stafford. Obviously, was a big part of that. Um, you've got um, Von Miller. That's two trades. The point is, how many different trades took place. How many free agents were picked up? To say that the Rams bought a Super Bowl doesn't make any sense. Because if you could buy a Super Bowl... and uh, here Again, here's the point. If at, in 2021 I said pick the team that was going to win the Super Bowl based on the team that's done the most in free agency and, 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 well, free agency, who would you have said won the Super Bowl? The team that spent the dead last in uh, free agency and got a subpar quarterback. And then, you know, Von Miller is a good football player, although I don't know what he did with the Rams. Let's see. 
Let's see, he started the year with Denver, and then it looks like at the trade deadline they picked him up. He ended with uh, 854 pressures on 355 attempts, eight sacks. So that's pretty solid. Then they dropped a million bucks on Odell Beckham. Did that buy them a Super Bowl? Nobody else spent more than that? What about Tampa the year before? Who did they trade for in 2020? Tampa traded for Steve McClendon and Rob Gronkowski. And as far as free agency, they were 10th. The Lions, the Dolphins, the Jets, the Jaguars, the Bills. The Bills, by the way, have been at the top seemingly about every year in free agent spending, and they're not getting a Super Bowl, which is weird because they're trying to buy one, and they can't. So, again, the point is you cannot buy a Super Bowl. You can't. It's not possible. Every year... Every team does everything that they can to build the best possible roster to try to win a Super Bowl. Some teams spend more than others. Those are usually teams that have more. You have to be a bad team with a bad roster full of guys that are not making any money so that you can have a lot of money to spend. And then you spend a lot of money and you give it your best. The year before that, the year the Chiefs won, you know who spent the second most in free agency? The Green Bay Packers. After that was the Buffalo Bills. Neither team won a Super Bowl. We tried to buy it. Didn't work. So the statement that you can buy a Super Bowl is false. There is no formula to spending money and that turning into winning a Super Bowl. You can spend money in hopes that it makes you better, in hopes that in becoming better, we can win a Super Bowl. But there's several layers between paying and winning a Super Bowl. So you cannot draw a straight line directly from buying and Super Bowl. That's why I say you cannot buy a Super Bowl. One of these I thought was a Tom, it's a Trevor. So we do have one more call here. Hey, Ryan, things a little messed up. They give us a bye week, and then they put us on Monday night. So now not only do we have a bye week, now we don't get to watch on Sunday. And all right. What's up with that? Come on, Monday night games, it just makes Sunday. Feels like nothing going on. But anyway. Um, I just think, you know, you're going to give us Monday bye week, but on Sunday is the following week. The only good thing I like about it is I get to enjoy other games. Sunday is, you know, when the Packers are playing, Packers are the only thing that matters. But it's a low-stress Sunday when they're not playing on Sunday. I can watch the Bears lose. I can watch all these other teams I don't like lose, and it's great. And then, you know, you got uh, you got something to actually look forward to on Monday because I don't watch Thursday or Monday night football almost ever unless there's something worth watching and they're usually it's unless it's bears vikings packers i'm not watching it so it's one perk ridiculous um i know you were asking for show well not asking necessarily but you know you were saying you need something else i watched breaking bad a bunch of times too um i don't know if you watched better call Saul at all the spinoff about i thought about it because i know i started it before and i just didn't really care for it i thought about trying it again but I didn't, and I actually settled on um, watching Ozark again for like the third time through. So I don't know, man. I was hoping to find something a little more light, but I can't really find it. So just sticking with sticking with something I know I like until something better comes along. Come uh, on, computer. lawyer. Uh, like before, was it before Breaking Bad? Um, it's not quite the same, you know. It's not, but um, I think it's a really good show. It's all on Netflix, except uh, the last season, which just finished. I'm waiting for that one to come out if I can watch that. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I give that one a try if you like Breaking Bad, um, because I think you'll like that one, too. Go back, go. Appreciate it, Trevor. Tom, what else you got for us, man? hey Hey. Uh, so, uh, I'm just curious, because um, I'm too lazy to go and do this myself, so I'm going to ask you to do it for me. I hate when people preface that, because it means you're going to ask me to do work. And I'm trying not to do that, but go ahead, Tom. Thank you so much for volunteering. Um, how do the Packers do against mobile quarterbacks compared to the pocket passers? I believe I asked this question like when the uh, show first started, but I'm specifically asking for this year. Uh, would love to hear what you find. Thank you so much once again for doing this. Um, Thank you for pulling through. All right. All right. So I'm trying to think of the easiest way to do this. 
Um, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go to PFF and look at quarterbacks based on rushing grade. See, the, the, the only issue that I have, there's several issues with just kind of doing this in a blanket sense, because it's looking at the best rushing quarterbacks and then saying, did we win or lose, implying that the quarterback themselves were the reason, as opposed to, you know, maybe it was their running game or their passing game or maybe our offense couldn't score enough points or whatever. But anyways, um, also there's, for example, the number one running quarterback is Josh Allen and we lost to Buffalo. But again, packaging that up as we lost because Josh Allen is a mobile quarterback kind of doesn't do justice to the fact that the Bills are a really, really good football team. Also, also, I'd want to know comparatively. That would be the best way to do it, because then you could look at it and say, you know, all these things comparatively, how do the Packers do? Is there some kind of a difference between the mobile quarterbacks, how we do comparatively, and the non-mobile quarterbacks comparatively, because then maybe the mobile, the mobility has something to do with it. But I'll be honest, man, I'm not doing any of that. So, um... Buffalo, we lost. Let, 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 you know what? Let's just forget all that. I'm not doing all that. That's way too much. Uh, Buffalo, we lost. Chicago has a mobile quarterback. We won twice. Dallas has Dak Prescott, who, according to this, is one of the least mobile. Now, y- y- you got to understand, least mobile, I don't mean that they're um, unable, but it just means that they're really bad at it. He has a 41 rushing grade which probably has something to do with his 15 fumbles this season. But either way, he only has 173 rushing yards, so I would say he's not a mobile quarterback. Uh, Detroit does not have a mobile quarterback, and we lost. Minnesota does not have a mobile quarterback, and we lost. Oh, you know what? I was still on 2021. Actually, Dak Prescott is in the... uh, He's back in the good graces of PFF's rushing. He must not be fumbling as much this year. Whatever. Doesn't really change much. Uh, So Dak is a mobile quarterback, and we beat Dallas. Figured it out because I could not find Bailey Zappi. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Bailey Zappi, second lowest uh, rushing grade, and we lost to the Patriots. Um, I'm not seeing much correlation between wins and losses and mobility. Uh, Jalen Hurts can move. We lost. Tom Brady cannot. We won. Tennessee and Washington, I think, is a no, and we lost. I'm sure, again, there are better ways to do this, but it's going to take a lot of time, and I'm I'm just not doing it on the spot right now. Just thinking of the best way to do it um, would kind of take a long time. But in terms of wins and losses, nah. But, all right, let's, uh, let's do one more. I press leave because way too quickly because the thought came into my head again. I want Goody gone. I want him fired. I want Rogers gone. I want this whole team dismantled. Uh, they didn't get a win this week. Um, they didn't even uh, appear on the field. It's how bad that they were this week. Like, I, I, I don't know what's going on. It's, they can't win. If they're not even trying, and they didn't even try, didn't even suit up. I'm sick of this team. Sick of it. Well, I think we all Bye. we all understand your frustration, and uh, I hope that you are comforted in knowing that um, we get four more weeks to try to win one. How's that for comforting? Not very? All right. Well, I tried. Anyways, you guys have yourselves a great night. Uh, I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.